So today, I was uh, wanted to look at uh, classes, but uh, maybe I'm going too fast for some people. Do you want to look at some problems that you're working on in this functions lab? Yeah. Do you want to pick, pick one? Tell me, tell me which one you want me to look at. Four. Four. Oh, generate a web page. Let's do that. So this is a web page that contains a list of 100 random uh, red, green, blue color values. The program should write something like the following into C out right here. So it'll look like this. So this is an exercise for <clears throat> Yeah, that's good. So I just write a hello program there. Just says hello, or it says OK. All right, now <clears throat> we want to output something like that. So and we want to write this to uh, to see out. Organize your code using functions. The following shows how to save the output of your program to a file named colors.html. After doing this, open the file in a web browser to see the result. So let's practice this. You can see this. This is a web page. You know, there's a there are these um, elements that enclose other elements. It's kind of a it's a hierarchical organization. So the HTML element is at the top of the hierarchy. It's the top of the tree, and under the HTML element are the sub elements. There's a head element. That's the first sub element in the, the HTML element, and then the second element is the body element. And that's here. Notice these elements, they, they start with a start tag and close with an ending tag. The ending tag has a slash here, you know, and then followed by the tag name. So this is how sections of the document are, are labeled or organized or grouped. So we have a um, the start element and this end element. And then there's a uh, head tag. Oops. I didn't do that right. Then there's a body tag. And uh, maybe inside the body tag, we say something like, uh, you know, like, like, hi. All of this is being output to see out. So let's see what it would look like. See, so it just dumps it like that. And if we, if we open that, and it, then we can use this, this syntax here to redirect the standard output away from the display into a file named colors.html. So now we have colors.html as a file. We can open that in the browser. And there it is. You know, we uh, just viewed a page source. We see it looks like that. That's our, our output. Okay.
we could organize this, make it a little easier to read. Let's put in two spaces here. It makes it a little, little bit easier to read. See, now we have indentation that shows the organization. And here's, we need to add this title element here. Let's do that. That's in the head section. Now we have a title element inside the head element. And let's, uh, let's add this business here. So we have an ordered list. OL is an ordered list. So we have the opening tag and the closing tag. And inside the opening and closing tags, we have list items, which, have, which are also started with an opening tag and ended with a closing tag. So we'll just do, we'll do the same color over and over again just to see what it looks like. Stick there. Oh, do you see the problem? You know, in the HTML code here, there's a um, there's a quote right there, and then there's another quote here, and that's <coughs> interfering with uh, our our string our string literals here. The string literal starts with a quote and uh, ends with a quote. But we, because we find a quote in the middle here, the compiler is trying to end this, our string here, right there. And then it, it doesn't understand what comes after that. So we need to tell the compiler that this quote is, not, is meant to be part of the string, not meant to terminate the string. So we do that by using a backslash. That's an that's a indication to the compiler, a message to the compiler to include <clears throat> that quote as a um, as a as a as a character within the string, not as a a string delimiter. There we go. Now we open this. Oh, that won't work. We need to direct it to. Um, See, this is the redirection operator on the command line. It's not a C++ operator. I mean, it is, but here, this symbol is being used at the command line. It's outside of the context of C++. This is a, uh, a special symbol that's used by the uh, command line interpreter. And now we can uh, open that file. There it is. So that's what that color looks like, by the way. That's what. 3, 2, 4A, F3 looks like. It's a blue. It makes sense. This is the red component. This is the green component, 4A. And the blue component is the largest number, so it dominates the color. That's why it looks blue. RGB, red, green, blue. <coughs> now, what we want to do is instead of this color here, we want to generate a random color string and then use that instead. And we want to do it a hundred times. So let's let's do the hundred times first. For int 
i is 0, i is less than 100, plus plus i. That's, there's your standard loop that runs 100 times. There it is. So it's a lot. Now, here, we want to generate a random color string and then use it in two places inside the string. So it'll look something like that. Now, notice, watch how I'm building the code incrementally. I'm not writing the whole thing out at once, right? You sit down in the lab, you can't just write the whole answer out at once. You've got to break it into these little pieces. So <clears throat> I'm going to declare a variable called color, and I'll set it to, to this. I got an extra code in there. Now, instead of using this, I want to use that, that variable color. And then we'll just change that variable color. So we've got to get that variable color in here. And how do we do that? Well, we, use, we do this. We close the string there, use the string concaten concatenation operator plus, and then we include the value of this color variable, and then we concatenate with, um, with the rest of the string. And then we have to do the same thing here. And I'm just going to copy that. I know it's getting hard to read now, right? So there it worked. It's the same result. That's what we wanted. But we've moved, we've introduced a variable now that we can change its value. So in this output, We've, uh, we're now using a variable that could change its value. In fact, what we'll do there is, um, before I move on, does anybody want, does anybody want me to spend more time on that expression? It's kind of messy. I can break it out. We can break it onto several lines. You know, first we output this. Then we output this. Then we output this. Maybe this is easier to, to follow. I, I don't know. So what you want to do is put it in a form that's, that's easy for you to read. So there's many ways to do this. And here I, I broke it out so it's kind of like, you know, one piece at a time being outputted. So we're not doing string concatenation anymore. We're just writing in the C out over and over again. Let's check that that gives us the same result. It's the same thing. Is that easier to read and understand? Well, you know, you to really understand it and read it, you have to do it yourself. Right? You can't just watch me. So just store this away. There's many ways to organize that. You've got to use the backslash to escape a quote if you want the quote to appear inside of the string. And the other thing to keep in mind is that these kinds of expressions where you have a lot of pieces that are assembled together to make some larger string can be very messy very messy looking. So when you get to that point, you have to be very careful about uh, what you're doing. All right, now here, instead of hard coding the color in here, let's call a function. I'll call it, uh, I'll call it um, generate color.
So we'll just get a color. We're gonna, we have a function called generate color. And that returns a string. This is red, green, blue. Whoops. So we'll make it red just to test it. We want to see it red. So see that? I'm stubbing it out here. I didn't, I'm not like trying to do the whole problem all one time. I want to hammer this in. You got to break it into pieces. We're now going to use a function, and this time we're you're just going to have the function return the same string over and over again, just to make sure that the code is set up correctly. There it is. So this part of the program, see main right now? Main is 100% finished. There's nothing else we need to do to main to make the program work. Isn't that nice? We can just say main is done. Everything that we need to do is now inside this generate color function. That's what we have to implement. You see how convenient, how, uh, how, um, how using functions helps you to organize the logic of a program. You're going to break, it helps you break your logic into pieces and uh, separate those pieces because if you, everything is merged together into one large whole, it's very hard to keep track of what's going on. All right, so let's let's do this generate color. So we need a, a random color string. I think we've done this already, right? Haven't we done this problem? We just didn't use a function. <clears throat> let's do something like um, we have a string called color here. And I don't remember exactly how we did this. Let's uh, write another function, which is get a random digit or generate random digit. And uh, append that to this uh, color variable and return that. See that? Declare color, which is an empty string. And then for six times, for six times, uh, call generate random digit and append it onto this color variable. Keep in mind this color variable here is scoped to exist only within this function. Similarly, this color variable here is scoped to exist only inside the for loop. See, this it's it's declared here and it exists at this level. See the 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 bracket right there? So it doesn't exist outside of this. This color variable is only visible inside that section of code. So this is a different color variable, it just happens to be the same name. And this is visible inside of that section of code there. Those are called different scopes. So now we need to implement get random digit. Who can tell me? Use what do you think I want to put there? Think about how I solving problems. You know, how what would I do next here? You, you know me, you know me by now. What am I going to do here? SRAM for parentheses times two. Huh? The SRAM? No. I, I keep talking about this over and over again so you get the idea, but I know everybody's missing it. But, you know, maybe I'm not teaching it correctly, but, you know, if what am I trying to teach you? What, what would you do next here? Based on what I've been talking about so far today already. You know, the method of development that I... Trying to convey to you? Maybe 
The string variable? Huh? String variable? Declare a string variable? No. It's very simple. Yeah. Print a random number, just one number. Print a random number? No. You're, you're missing it out. It's simpler than that. It's like dead simple. Dead simple. That's why you, everyone is like very confused about how to do stuff because you don't see the simplicity of this. Yeah. Test your code. Yeah, and how do you do that right now? Right here. What's the next step that we're going to do? A baby step. What is a baby step? Tiny little thing. What would I do right now? Save. Huh? Save. Save? Just, just see out. See out a window. No, see, I'm not going to see out here. This is the function. This, we've got to return a string. It won't compile unless they return a string. Huh? Really? Anybody have an idea? So nobody gets it yet, you know, what I'm trying to teach. Make it just one integer. Huh? Make it just one integer. Exactly. Get very good. Got it. Yeah, maybe that's going to gel some thinking across the class here. It's very straightforward. Return just something, just a random, just a digit. That's called a stub. You see how simple that is? Then we're going to test it. See that? Now they're all C's. See now this function. Look at generate color. Just like main, is one. 100% finished. We don't have to touch it anymore. Do you see that how that works? All we got to do is finish generate random digit and we're done. Okay. Now srand we only call once. So we do it up here. Remember don't call it over and over again. Just, just call it once. We only want to seed the random number generator once. If we seed it in a loop, we're going to give it the same seed because we're passing. It's the same number of seconds because the program runs all within you know a millisecond. And so we're going to get the same number of seconds every time we call SRAN. We're going to get exactly the same value over and over again. So we only call SRAN once. So you do it in main, say at the beginning. <laughs> now it's it's not as the next step is not as simple. Now we want a random number. We want a random value, you know, zero through f. So we'll call rand and use uh, mod sixteen. And uh, what are we going to do here? This is our number. And uh, if, I'm going to do it like this. If n is 0, return a 0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Something like that. <clears throat> That's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A. That's not working right. And uh, B. Oops. Uh, C. D, A, B, C, what's that? Say it again. If N is 10, then you want to return an A, not if N is A. Because N is an integer. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you know, it was, it was so repetitive, I started thinking about something else. So let's uh, let's go ahead and get these done. That's a one, a two, a three, a four, 
5, a 6, a 7, an 8, a 9, a 10, 11, up, 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 what am I doing? Now we're going backwards. C, D, E, F. Assert false. Well, why did I put that in there? Should never reach here, right? So I'll just crash the program if I ever reach there. <laughs> Assert false always fails. So um, <clears throat> that should do it. That's it. There it is. Look at that. You know, it's that incremental development. I, I say it over and over again, and I and I don't know why it's a, it doesn't seem to sink in. But it's um, I don't see how else you're going to be able to solve these problems unless you. Break it down to very small steps, and the, the skill would be to see what it is you do next. You know, and coming up with this code here, but well, this was all one shot, right? This came out one shot here. That that was a little, that was a little, a lot to to, to produce a one one throw. But to all the other code was so small. I mean, every step was very tiny. Now, just a matter of sequencing it out and uh, testing at the right time. And remember, we finished main. When generate color was a stub, all we did was return some string. We finished, 100% finished constructing main. We were done. We could forget all about it. And then we went to, to do generate color. And while we did generate color, we, we defined this function, generate random digit, which just returned a character. And then we finished implementing generate color 100%. We finished it. Then we could forget all about it. And then it, it came down to just this generate random digit. And we could forget all about web pages and you know HTML tags. We could forget about that, that we want a string of We could forget about the number six, that we need six random digits together. We don't have to think about it because we finished it already. All we need to do right now is write code to generate a single random digit and return that. That's it. Do you see how you cut away and focus on the piece that needs to get done? So that's the, I think a lot of people are, you, you just have to work on that. All right, how about um, anything else? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. How, how would you work this on? Uh... Um, Visual Studio. In Visual Studio? How many people use Visual Studio? One, two, three. Can, in lab, um, Jaron can show you how to do that in Visual Studio. It's the same thing. You Basically, oh, with Visual Studio, you need to open up a terminal window. Because you're already writing code in Visual Studio, right? So you need to uh, open up a terminal window. And uh, CD over to the um, uh, to where the uh, executable is generated. There's a debug folder, and you go in there. You'll see a something.exe in there, and then at the command line you run that, and you it's it's the same output operation, I, I think. I think they use this. They use that as well for redirection. So it's, it's pretty much the same thing. You just have to find that debug folder where that executable file is. Did you find it? Yeah. I know Jaron's been doing uh, a pretty good job covering the, the lab problems. So. 
It's, uh, if you go to lab, that's good. He's, he's, he's uh, covering this stuff. All right, how about um, we talk, start talking about classes here. And uh, this, is, uh, this is actually a hard topic. This is difficult. And we're just going to sample it. We're just going to look at the very basics, the very beginning of it. We're not going to get into it deeply. And uh, it's difficult, actually. And, um, but what we're going to look at won't be very difficult, just, just a little tricky. And, uh, but later, like in the course of follows this, 202, and, uh, you'll spend a lot of time on classes. And then there's this exam two. And exam two basically tests you on classes. And classes includes functions, by the way. <clears throat> and classes is like defining your own data type. You know, like you have the string data type. And, uh, and, and you know, the string data type is, is a class. And you can actually look up the... In the header files, you can find out and see the implementation of uh, the class uh, data type. Let me uh, get started on this. So here's a main function. Just says OK. There it is. And now I'm going to talk about what a class is. By the way, did you try that in Visual Studio? Did you get there or not? Oh, don't don't do it, huh? I found it, but I didn't try. You didn't try it. What's the name of the file? It ends with .exe, right? Yeah. Are you in a terminal window? Yeah. Can you type in? Just type in. What's the name of the program? Is it like you know ex4.exe? What are, what's the name of the file? It doesn't say it's just an executable. Yeah, what's the name of it? Just this application. No, no, the name of the file. Doesn't it have a file have a name? It's, so the name of the CDP, I mean. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it ends with a .exe, right? Or, or it doesn't, up because you didn't turn that on. Just type that in on the command line. The name of that, and just see if it runs. Just type that in, just directly, in the terminal window. Assuming that you CD'd into that debug folder. No. It just closes. Huh? It just closes. Well, I have to look at it later. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's talk about this now. A string. Watch this. Here's a string s, and. Um, and let's uh, let's uh, let's just define it like that. So here we created an instance of a string. By the way, this is equivalent to doing this. These are the same thing. But I'm going to write it in this form because that's the form that uh, we're going to be using. The compiler allows this form. But this is the form we'll use with our own data types, with our own classes. So now we can uh, output that uh, string. There it is. But the string has uh, functions. We can output its, um, its size. See, s.size. Now that, that's what we're calling a function. We want to know how many characters are in string. So it should return, uh, in the string s, so it should return five. Oh, what happened? Did I not save? There it is, five. So that's a function, see? Size is a function available on strings. There's other functions, like uh, substring. I'm not sure that's the right uh, yes. spelling. And let's, let's start in position one 
and go for three characters. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. Is that the length? Does anybody know the substring function, the two arguments? The first argument is the starting position of the substring. So position one is here. This position zero. This is position one. Now the second argument, which I have as three there, I'll change it to a two. Is the second argument, well that won't work either. Let me change this to a two, like that, to a three. There we go, that's better. So the first argument, two, is the position, the starting position, which is this first L. Now the second argument is either the ending position or one past the ending position or the number of characters in the substring. Now different languages have defined it in all those different ways. It's just a matter of remembering in your language how they define it. In JavaScript, I think they, this is the number of characters. I mean, I think in C++, is this one past the last character? Does anyone know? Let's see, let's see what it prints. It's gonna, if it's a number of characters, it's gonna print LLO. If it's the last position, it'll print LL. If it's, uh, if it's um, one past the last position, it'll just print L. So does it print LLO, LL, or L? Let's see. LLO. So that's the number of characters. That's how long the substring is. I know we could verify that. Watch this. You know, this thing returns a substring. So the substring that this returns, that's a string, by the way. This thing is a string, LLO. It is a string object. And string objects, you can invoke the size function on them. You see that? And then we'll compare it with three. And we'll assert that. So S substring two comma three returns a string of length three. And then we, we extract its size, which is three, and compare it to three, which is true. So the assert is um, just quietly returns without terminating the program. See that? That works. Uh, just to show you, see these dots, how these work? This is called the dot notation. It's a way to uh, call a function. Uh, remember what we did in the previous problem. We wrote a function called uh, generate color. We call it like that. You see that these are both functions. Substring is a function, and generate color is a function. But they're 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 um, they're different in the following way. Generate function is called a global function. You just call it. It doesn't have to be. It's not relative to any piece of data. But this substring function, you have to call it using the dot notation. With a with a with an object, so you need to have uh, an an instance of data, a string instance, that has to exist. Then you can call the substring function relative to it, and so this substring function operates on this string. But the generate color function, the way we defined it, it we don't call it in relation to any pre-existing piece of data that's uh, in the code. We just call it. It's a, called a global function. So they're both called functions, but they, they, are, uh, they have a different syntax. Now, um, 
let's go ahead and create our own data type. And let's call it something like um, a greeting. Watch this. Oops. Now I'm going to create an instance of the greeting data type. I'm going to pass in the string called Bob. And this greeting data type will have a function uh, called um, maybe say. <clears throat> and what I want this to print, I want it to say, hello, Bob. It's kind of a silly example. You define a class called greeting, and um, there's a we'll call it a public section. And this is the syntax you use, and there's a constructor which takes a string, and there's a function called um, say, which returns a string as well. And uh, this save function, so this is called the declaration of the class. And there's a constructor that takes a, a string and it builds an instance of this class called an object. And then we can operate on the object by calling, by invoking the say function. It should say, hello, Bob. And I want to show you how to, we need to implement the constructor and the the say function. I'm going to show you how to do that. So the constructor looks like this. I'm going to, I'm going to call that instead of I'm going to call that a name. So that's we're going to greet that that person. And then um, the say function. like this. So we'll have this, this variable called name. I'm going to just set it to, uh, to Sally here. So when we call this say function, the say, say function it's going to return a string, and the string will be this concatenation. Oh, sorry, that's not a comma. Oh, yeah, there it is. It'll be the concatenation of this string, hello, comma, space, with this name, which is set to Sally. So it should say, you know, hello, Sally. Let's see if that works. I spelled greeting. It's grading, right? This, this material is grading on me. Okay, that's a greeting. So it says, hello, Sally, good. Like we might want to fix that up a little bit and put a, put a period there if we want to be, you know, make it a full sentence. Okay, now we don't want to say hello, Sally. We want to say hello, Bob. In fact, uh, we want several of these instances. We want to, maybe this is called G1, and uh, maybe this is G2, and, uh, and this is, say, uh, Alice, Bob and Alice. And we want to say, um, you know, hello, Bob, and hello, Alice. So this, this data here, this string, the name, is, 
is contained in that data type instance. It's contained in the class instance. It's contained in the object. I use three words. They're all synonyms. Object, class instance, data type instance. I just repeated those because they're all equivalent in meaning. So uh, what we do there is the Sally cannot be stored inside. See, this, this Bob string, Sally string, or Alice string rather, is passed into this constructor. And uh, what we need to do is, is save it. And uh, so we, what we do is we add a, a, a variable declaration inside, the, inside this class description like this. And there's a, pub, there's a private section as well as a, as a public section. And the private section is a good place to put it right now. So I'm going to put it there. And it's, uh, it's a string called name. <coughs> So when the name gets passed into the constructor, what we want to do is copy it into the name, which is part of the object that's created out of this class. So when we create instances of this class, we're allocating memory to store a string. We're not allocating memory to store these functions. Those were already those are already existing. The functions don't need to be created. Every time you create a new instance of a class, you don't have to create the functions again. You just define the functions once, they sit in RAM, the definitions, and you invoke them when needed. But we could create a thousand instances of greeting. That means we need to have a thousand strings to represent a thousand different names. So this is the, the data that's sort of encapsulated inside the the objects. And look, by the way, here we just have one piece of data, one variable, but we could have any number inside of the class. So here we're saving this string that's passed into the constructor. This is here. This is where we're constructing an instance of greeting. Passing in the data Bob. Here we're passing in the data Alice. And that so this line here, this, this line which is called the constructor, causes this function, this is called the constructor function, it causes that to run. And when it runs, well, this name, that's the thing that's passed in here, Bob and Alice. And we take that name and we copy it into the name that's the variable defined for the uh, class. And now when we say we don't want to use this locally scoped name, we want to use the name that's a part of the, uh, the class. So I use this arrow to mean the, um, the instance variable name, not this uh, variable name here, which is the parameter, <coughs> function parameter. This is a, we use the word name here to represent the function parameter. I put this in front of name to distinguish it from the function parameter and say, no, this is, a, this is an instance variable. So this should do it. Hello, Bob. Hello, Alice. See how that works? See, here, <coughs> we're just... We're, we're, we're using the same variable name. We could even use different names there. If I had called this, um, you know, n, then, uh, then I would do this. See? I could change the name there. That's all right. But now, if we do it like that, we no longer need to prefix this reference to the instance variable name with this, because now it's, it's unambiguous to the compiler what name we're talking about. So I can just use the instance variable without prefixing it with that, this arrow. So this is good. The same down here. I don't need 
to prefix this. Well, some programmers actually always use that, and some languages always require it too. You know, like um, JavaScript and uh, I think Python. Let's just test that real quick. But let's see this. A lot of programmers think this is confusing because this constructor takes data that's copied directly into a member variable. So let's just use the same name. Let's just use the same name for the parameter in the constructor. So it's clear that it's just meant to be copied. In that case, we have an ambiguity here. So we, we use the this operator to, um, to tell a compiler that we want to copy it into, not into itself, we want to copy the, the, the parameter name into the instance variable name. But notice we didn't have to do that down here. That's because it's unambiguous. When we use the word name here, it can only mean the instance variable name because there is no locally scoped variable called name here. Because this, this name that was defined in that function is just scoped to this constructor function. It's not meaningful outside that function. So here we didn't need to um, distinguish between a locally scoped name and a and a, and a and a class scope name. Just use the class scope name directly. Now, just a little detail here. The save function does not modify the state of the class. So we can tell the compiler that that's the case. We just add the word const there. It means constant. When this function runs, it does not modify the state of the instance. Now this will not compile because, and this will be a common error that you'll get, and I'll show you that. The definition of say does not match any declaration in greeting. That's because uh, in the class declaration, this is called a declaration. In the class declaration, we said that say is const, but down here, we didn't add const to the to the definition of function. So I just added that in there. So they have to match exactly. Now it's good. Now, if we did something like this, maybe we wanted to change the object's name to Fred every time we call say. I mean, that's silly, but let's suppose we did that. Well, the compiler would re reject this code because by const, we said, oh, we're not modifying the state of the object. But in fact, we are. The state of the object, by the way, is, is determined by its member variables. That's it. When I say state of an object, it's just what the member variables are equal to at that point. A function that's declared as const will not modify any of its member variables. But here, say is modifying a member variable. So the compiler is going to say, hey, wait a minute, you said it was const. But there you are modifying a member variable. So that's, that's, a, that's a, that, that doesn't compute. See that? It's hard to read it, isn't it? But that's, in fact, what's going on. Let me see if I can read it. Yeah, well, they're talking about const here, right? The method is not marked const, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's really hard to tell. So we take that out, and uh, we're good. <clears throat> now, when you work on the problems, 
What we're actually going to do is use a, an organization scheme, which is very typical of, um, a pro of what you find in, the, in real code. There's going to be main, and then there's going to be a declaration in, called a header file. and an implementation file. There's going to be an implementation in there. So the header file, see this .h for header file, is just going to be include the, uh, the declaration of the class, which looks like that. Probably we need this, something like that. And the, um, the implementation file, which is greeting.cpp, <coughs> or C++. This is like when you create a project in Visual Studio, it creates these things for you automatically. We won't have this uh, greeting declaration here. We just have the implementation of the functions. We have two functions. We have a constructor function and the save function. What we need to do is include the greeting header file. Oops. Rather than angle brackets, we use a quote because it's uh, one of our files. It doesn't come from the standard library. It's a header file that we've defined. Well, that's how that looks. And now in main, We need to include that, uh, that greeting header file. And that means we don't need, by including the, the greeting header file, we don't need to define it here. We don't need to declare it here, rather declare it here. I'll take that out. Also, we're going to build these two functions as a separate compilation unit. So we have greeting.cpp. So we don't need these here as well. All we need is that. This is our main now. You can see there we have greeting.cpp. That has the implementation of the functions. Greeting.h, that has the class declaration in it. And then main.cpp, that's the like the test code, the driver thing that creates an instance of, of greeting. Well, two instances. Now to compile this a little tricky, we have to compile main.cpp, but we also need to tell the compiler to compile um, greeting.cpp as well. The header, we don't need to include that on this line because the header, there's an include directive that includes the header into the other into the CPP files. There it is. That's the standard organization. So that's what we're going to be following. We're going to use the standard organization. We have a class declaration in the header file. The uh, class implementation, in other words, the class's functions, the implementation of the class's functions in the CPP file. And then we have the test code that tests the class in main.cpp. Actually, our test code is going to look like, like this. We're going to have uh, these tests. We're going to say, This is what we're going to do. We're going to, rather than visually verifying that things are writing correctly, running correctly, we're going to 
write automated tests to, to verify that the class is uh, implemented correctly. So we use uh, we use an assert. Let's see if that works. What did I do wrong? Oh, G one say. That's a tough one. Undefined, oh, see this, undefined symbols for this architecture. And um, the constructor, the saying the constructor is undefined. And it's say is undefined. That's because it's not a compilation pass error. This is a linkage error. See this? Clang. This is the the compiler that's on the comes with Xcode. It's a linker command failed. So it compiled, but it didn't link. It was missing the implementation of the um, of the functions. There we go. Well, let's suppose we try this again. Oops. Let's create another, we'll call this one Alice. And we'll say, hello, Alice. And I'm going to put an error in there. Notice I didn't put a period. So the test code is bad. So the test code is bad. So it really should be a, should be a period here, right? But um, what happens if we didn't have that period there? What if we used an exclamation point? Now the, uh, the test code will fail. So, you know, we have not implemented, so maybe we write the test code first, and then we go back and find out the mistake, and we say, oh, I see, it's, uh, we need a period there, not, a, not an exclamation point. So uh, we get the test code to run, all tests pass. So this is an example of automated testing. And uh, this is pretty much the, um, for most of the work we're going to do now, it'll, your code will look like this. It'll be a bunch of asserts in the main. It'll be testing uh, functions and uh, classes that you write. Okay, is that, uh, that's it. I mean, that's it for, that's classes for this quarter. That's just all we're going to cover. But there's a lot of um, problems for you to work on. And it'll take a while for this to sink in. But once you, once you start getting used to this, defining your own data types, then, um, then it opens up a lot of possibilities for you. And by the way, this is how code is written these days. I mean, 99% of it, well, 90%, I don't know, maybe not 99 but this is what they expect you to do when you get a job. You have to know how to implement a class and, uh, and use it in, uh, to help organize your code. So the code, you know, these programs, we're looking at baby programs. It doesn't make sense to use all this extra machinery but when you work on a real problem, the thing gets very complicated. It's huge. And you end up in, uh, defining many classes. I mean, you know, like 100 classes or 50. And, uh, and it becomes useful to, uh, to help you think about your problem and to organize the logic that, uh, that makes up your solution, makes up your program. And these programs are big. I mean, 100,000 lines of code. A million lines of code? What's Windows right now? It's more than 10 million lines of code. Windows, the operating system. That's not Excel and Word and all that. Just 
just the Windows operating <coughs> system is more than 10 million lines of code. How do you manage 10 million lines of code? I mean, it's ridiculous. In your lifetime, you're not going to be able to read, even read 10 million lines of code. So, you know, the, the, the problem of managing these very large, complex computer systems is, you know, is, is, is an art. And, uh, and there's a lot of people that, you know, get paid good money to do it, obviously. So uh, take a look quickly here. I'm just going to close in a minute. Here's the example. Exam. So I, this is an exam I gave last quarter. This is what it looks like. You're going to sit down in this class and you're going to answer these problems here, just like that. Okay? You're going to write it on that paper and submit it. That's what, that's what it'll look like when you take the exam. This is the exam I gave last quarter. There's no answers for this. We can cover that later, maybe next lecture. And here's a problem that I gave on another exam before this. Called a, this is the school bus class. And, and this has um, some answers in it. Uh, we didn't cover this, the UML class diagram. I'll have to talk about that next time. So these are, um, I'm providing answers to, uh, to these problems here for that one. So this is practice for exam two. And uh, this is the lab exercise. So there's, there's a bunch of things to do here. There's exercise one. Implement a number class. The class is going to be called number. And then exercise two. Use that class to do something. Exercise three. Uh, you know, implement, define and implement an egg carton class. This is the, called the UML class diagram. Just briefly, the UML class diagram is a, sort of a just a visual tool to let you see an overview of the class. And this UML class diagram has three sections. One, two, three. See that? And the first section is just the name of the class. That's it. And the second, second section is the list of all the member variables. And the third section is a list of all the member functions. Remember the instances, when you create instances of a class, you're allocating memory to store these member variables. You're not allocating memory to store the functions. That's done once at the very beginning, even before you even use the class. Memory's been allocated to store the functions. It's only done once. But now, the memory to store the instances of a class that the functions run against, that's created whenever you create an instance of the class. So you can create, you know, 100 egg cart instances. That means you're going to have 100 integers to, to, to represent brown eggs and 100 integers to represent the white eggs. <coughs> Just sort of keep that in mind. So this is a UML class diagram. And uh, I could, in the exam, I can give you the UML class diagram and say, you know, define the declaration of the class. So you should start from this and write out the declaration of the class, you know, which looks something like, something like that. That's a class declaration, the, the header file. Or I can give you the header file and say, draw the UML class diagram. Go the other way. Because they're, they're equivalent. You can go from one to the other. All right. I think that's that's enough. Any questions? <clears throat>